<laughs> Everything's labeled here. It's true. This is the type of beer we're having. This is the type of it's the only, it's the board it's the billboard they have. Hey, quit pouring it over there. to get on camera Mike's story about getting a beer from Bill Garnier when he was 16. <laughs> but find a good place in here, we can do it quick. We'll find a picture of him. So we're here in the Crown, which is in the town of Aldborn. Uh, Easy Company was built here before Normandy, and this guy right here is Bill Garnier, Wild Bill Garnier, and that's him actually during the war. This is him post-war after he lost his leg in uh, the Battle of the Bulge. I had the pleasure of meeting him one time, and we were at Fort Town Gap. I was about 16 years old, dressed as a paratrooper in World War II in a 1942 jumpsuit. And he gave me the pin here on my hat, the 506 regimental pin, uh, and bought me a beer when I was 16, because he said he was drinking beer when he was 16. Uh, we're just uh, walking through Aldborn here. I'm with Rusty. And uh, just so you know, if you ever go on this tour, they stuff you full of roast beef, get you incredibly drunk, and then walk you through the town. <laughs> we're walking? So this is where the Quonset huts for many members of the 506 were located at the time. They dismantled them in the 1950s because the material was still in shortage up through that time. But if we head right up this way, we are going to see one of the few remaining ones that still stand in the vicinity. There's your project car. Wow. <laughs> There's your project. There it is. It's a survivor. <laughs> yeah. It says the father of the guy here or something arranged for the others to be taken over to Georgia. Some of the remnants of others at Camp Tekoa. Yeah. Yes. I think it speaks to like the the hidden witnesses of history. You know, just a seemingly simple corrugated steel structure yet a witness to these momentous times and interesting people. Was this where it was located or did they pick up and move it? No, they, they moved it from the field. Did they move it from the field? Yeah, they moved it from the field. Okay. Thanks for a good shed and gardening hut. Well, there you are. You could, there's a picture here of them standing outside. Ah. Carl would let you So she said that, where well, I'll let you say it. <laughs> well, no, this is where they conspired for the, the mutiny, where uh, the Easy Company sergeant's hut. And this was open just until a few weeks ago. They were doing excavations mm, there. Did they yeah. find anything interesting? Well, the, uh, the buttons and oh. all the kind of brill cream plate things. Uh -huh. and, you know, a lot of personal, uh -huh. personal stuff. Yes. Fascinating. And you'll see a lot of it in the heritage. Wonderful. Center. I've got to get you back in time to go to the heritage. Okay. <laughs> They were everywhere. I'm trying to see if I can get a picture of the. Um, I mean, there were just huts everywhere, yeah. and there were like roads here as well. I think is this the picture? Yes. Have a look. Here, are the two huts. That's right, because they were the huts were kind of. This this was the first time it was mm -hmm. done. I think it was here and down there, and then the other day further down. Ah. But of course, it had kind of roads and things. I mean, this was like the kind mm -hmm. of. The you know, and they said they were done by Operation Nightingale with the people who had been servicemen and women with them, um, you know, who were being rehabilitated. So, uh, an exciting thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. 
so this is where it all happened. Can you see it from here? Oh yeah. The outline. That, that was open a two, two weeks ago. So they put everything back very beautifully. But you can still see where it was. Well, they excavated it. I'm pretty sure they got everything. <laughs> here, or here. Isn't the door on the end? Yeah, yeah the door you would, would... You would have opened here. Oh, I see. And now I'm inside. <sighs> and now I'm going to go tell my captain that I don't like Sobel. <laughs> <laughs> Where did those trains take And the funny thing is, um, Don Malarkey had suspicions oh, that, that Winters really helped that orchestrate that. that. It was oh, yeah. facilitating oh, with the sergeants to some okay. extent. But Malarkey said that Winters' intentions were not selfish. He, Malarkey said that his concern was with the men. Because he had this firm conviction that Sobel was going to get them killed. And that he needed to help overthrow the man. I mean, so that was Malarkey's speculation. But... Uh, Certainly, winners didn't mind it when they stepped up on his behalf. The impressive part about it is a lot of people don't realize just how long they were. I mean, the 506 <laughs> was here for nine months before they left for, mm. they, for, they for really France. Lived, yeah, they, they truly, here, yeah. truly. They here, yeah. And then they came back for about another month, two months, mm. after they got off the line in Normandy. And then they were recovering here after Normandy and preparing for market garden here as well. Here. It was planted by you good people, look, it's paid for by you good people after the war because there was um, a lot of huts here but it was the maintenance unit, the maintenance, all the lorries were put into repair here but the mechanics slept here as well so um, it was quite an important place and after the war these trees were planted. <laughs> this is where the men of Easy Company would have gone for socializing and dancing and the story is is that they absolutely ruined the hardwood floors that were in this structure but being the good allies that they were they paid to have them replaced this was the barnes homestead which was a grocery store at the time and winners and lieutenant harry welsh resided right here on the second floor and for all of the wartime letters, including several to his kind of girlfriend that he had at the time by the name of Dieta Allman, were written from this location. This is where he developed quite a friendship and quite a personal connection, not only with this community at large, but also the family that resided here. Now, one thing that Winters complained about, he said that he said that the British were behind the Americans in regard to technology, plumbing, electricity. He said he missed a hot dog, they didn't have popcorn, they didn't have like these basic things that he had taken for granted. Uh, but nonetheless, he developed this affinity. And one reason why he fit so well into their household, well, we'll talk about that at our next stop. Right there. There you right, go. Let's... <laughs> no way. We need to recreate the photo on our way out. <laughs> yeah. I think it's rather. F I think they. I think they buy them as a job lot because they've got the little, the children is looking just like the, a the adults. <laughs> yeah. The parish goes back to what, the 13th century. It's about the 13th century. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. Yes. And there's a lot of them. Um, kind of people that have been around for a long time, the Goddard. And the have you found it? Yes. Oh wow. 
Wow, um, wow. So, Great. who is he? Dick Winters and Harry Welsh resided in the post office and general store of Francis and Louis May Barnes. And sadly, their son was killed in the Royal Air Force in June 1942. He was approximately the same age as Dick Winters. And so when Winters entered the Barnes home, he was entering into a home that was in mourning. And this is one reason why he developed such affinity with the Barnes family, so much so to the extent that he referred to Louie May as Mother Barnes, and she kind of became his surrogate mother while he was living here in Oldbourne. And so he was incredibly close to the family, and to an extent he became a replacement son for this young man who was uh, killed during the war. Um, and sadly, uh, his father died of natural causes before the war was over. But uh, he, he would come here, and this was a place that he would um, often venture to. And in May of 1944, just uh, 16 days before D-Day, um, Ronald Spears was married in this very church to Edwina Griffiths, who was in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. Uh, at the time, and uh, have a photograph of that day too. Oh, and there's, the oh. there's the officer standing in front of, uh, of the church. The church. Oh, how fantastic! Leo Boyle was married here as well, and. Winter said to us, yesterday we had two weddings here. One officer, Spears, married a girl from Scotland and a fine bonnie lass she is too. <laughs> <laughs> and a staff sergeant from my company married a local girl. I went to the sergeant's wedding. That was the first church wedding I ever attended. And what an ordeal that was. That's worse than jumping from a plane in a fight. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> Why my legs were quivering and I was just an onlooker. Men being men and men being what they are, there naturally were a few tricks besides a lot of the usual ribbing. They stole the ring just before he left for the church, unbeknownst to him and returned it during the ceremony just before the time for the ring. So all were sweating out that one. Next they had some signs. One said, target for tonight. <laughs> Placed in strategic places. Then as we were leaving the church, a beautiful smoke screen was placed upward, and in the confusion, the bride was whisked away in a taxi. We're here in the Heritage Center in Oldbourne, and a little bit ago, we were out at the football field where the Quonset huts were located, and we mentioned that they were doing some digs out there, and what we have here in the display case right in front of me are some of the very unique findings, and they include pieces of a reserve parachute, uh, buckles and harnesses from some of the chutes, ammunition, end blocks, canteens, and even some dog tags, and so a real treasure trove of fairly recently recovered Easy Company artifacts we can see right here. We're going to wrap things up at this episode at The Crown, which was the enlisted man's pub for members of Easy Company here in Oldbourne, in contrast to the Blue Boar, where we had lunch, which was the officer's pub. So there was a degree of segregation among the ranks here. Thanks once again so much for tuning in to Real History. Check out all of our other great Band of Brothers content here on this channel. Until we see you next time, stay curious. Pims, the drink that keeps on giving. <laughs>